two, one. Welcome to Facebook Live. We're here at Breast Cancer Care and Breast Cancer Now. My name is Rachel. I'm one of the nurse specialists and I'm joined by Leanne Perro, who I've known for quite a few months now. And you might have seen her profile on Instagram or through some of the work that we've been doing over the months with Black Women Rising. We're going to talk a little bit more about that. Um, we're here today, um, slightly late, but in terms of um, June as a month, it's Cancer Survivorship Month, and I know Leanne and I have talked a lot about um, survivorship and, and what happened to you at the end of your treatment and how difficult things were. I wondered if you could just um, explain to everybody in a moment just about when you were diagnosed and then what happened at the end of your treatment. Mm -hmm. And just to say to you that if you do have any comments you want to make, any questions you want to ask us live, then please do drop them in and we will try and get to them as we go along. Those we don't get to, I will answer later tonight. So Leanne, can you tell me a little bit about when you were diagnosed? Um, you were really young, weren't you? Yeah. So my name is Leanne Perro, and I was diagnosed with stage three breast cancer at the age of 30. Um, and that was in October 2016. So I was diagnosed, my mum's had breast cancer twice before. Um, and the second time she was diagnosed was six months before my own diagnosis. So I'd kind of nursed my mum through her diagnosis and then um, obviously was worried about my own breasts. I have three other sisters as well, um, so we were obviously quite paranoid about it. And then um, I found a lump, and I went to the doctors, went for all the checks and everything else that everyone else has gone through. And luckily for me, they found breast cancer. And that must have been so difficult with your yeah. mum and having looked after her. And then... Definitely. I think it was difficult for the whole family, to mm -hmm. be honest with you. I think. It was one of those things that I, I say, and I say it honestly, that it was probably the worst news that I would ever hear in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I had always been very active, so I run a dance company, danced all my life, been very fit and healthy, and um, I suppose I got to that point where I, I thought I would never have expected my body to sort of fail me, mm -hmm. so to speak, um, at such a young age as well. Mm -hmm. I, went to the doctors and, and, and when the consultant called me in, who was the same consultant that my mum had, okay. I just knew that something was up. And um, yeah, my worst fears were confirmed. And, and the words were, um, I'm not going to beat around the bush, we found cancer. Um, and I think that first initial appointment was what really scared me because of my age and things like that, there was quite a lot of information I had to digest. Um, and that appointment still up until now, and we're two years on, you know, from that appointment, it still traumatizes me now. So I was told, you know, that I'd have to have obviously chemotherapy um, for a year. I was told that I would have um, treatment afterwards as well, um, Herceptin. Um, I was told that we'd have to go through genetic testing. Um, I was also told that I would have to remove one of my breasts, if not two. And um, I was also told about the fertility treatments because I hadn't started a family yet and, um, you know, that chemotherapy stops periods. So, you know, and, and I think all of that information in one go. Oh, and the added fact that, you know, we have to go and check if it's spread around the body. Mm -hmm. That really, really sort of scared me. Um, and it really, it, it made things very difficult for me mm -hmm. at the beginning of starting of my treatment. Mm -hmm. And in terms of support around that time, particularly when your mum had been through, yeah. what she had been through and was still going through, yeah. and having to draw on those around you, yeah. when you knew that your mum was also needing that support, yeah. it was really difficult. I think it was great the second time. So my mum the first time had to have chemotherapy and she had to have quite vigorous treatment. Mm -hmm. And that was, you know, 21 years prior. Mm -hmm. This time round, they caught it so early, she didn't actually have to have that. She only went on hormone therapy. Um, she did have another insectomy, but she didn't have to have any chemo or anything like that. So I think on that part, she was rebuilding her life again. Mm. Um, so when I got diagnosed, it was almost like, yeah, here we go again. But so almost like, thank God, you know, I'm not still on treatment and I can support you fully here. Mm. So, so that was the great aspect. 
what I found was there were so many other aspects to my diagnosis that I found very, very difficult. As a 30-year-old uh, person that was very social, somebody that was, you know, in the middle of, you know, running a business, um, you know, I was told automatically by the doctors that, you know, I'd have to, to give up my job for a year um, because I would be too ill from the treatment to, to focus on that. I was also at the start of a business management degree as well, so I had to obviously put that on hold. Um, but what I found socially was was it, the cancer, you know, and the word cancer was very unsociable. You know, I talk about it now, and, I, and I'm so far removed from where I was at the time, but I'm always very honest. I lost a lot of my support network when I was diagnosed with cancer. Looking back, I think it made people feel awkward, but, um, you know, maybe when you're not that person that's able to go out and socialise and also be that person to help everybody. I've been in the community um, world for a long time so I've, my work revolves around the community empowering communities so I'm used to helping a lot of others I'm not very used to yeah. taking help, help myself yeah. um, so I think when the role sort of reversed mm -hmm. it was very very difficult yeah. and um, as a result you know people distanced themselves away from me mm -hmm. um, you know the phone stopped ringing in that aspect so my social circle and my support network became really small mm -hmm. and as I've gone around and spoken to lots of other women mm -hmm. no matter what age or what you know stage of diagnosis they've had and um, it seems to be something that's quite common um, yeah. I'm very thankful for it now mm -hmm. because it's made me realize who I've got as my core support network mm -hmm. but at the time going through the illness in the vulnerable place that mm -hmm. I was I didn't quite understand it and I didn't realize that cancer was so unsociable yeah, yeah. yeah. And did you find that people stopped, I mean you mentioned this bit about this, but did you find that people didn't talk to you in the street? And, uh, well I found that people just didn't, um, I kind of went into hiding mm -hmm. a little bit after my diagnosis anyway. I, I was just too traumatised and didn't have the energy to, to get about unless it was for the hospital and, mm -hmm. and my treatment anyway. But I just found the phone just wouldn't stop ringing. Mm -hmm. uh, the phone just wouldn't stop ringing. The it phone stopped. stopped ringing and you know the messages from people just didn't mm -hmm. come. And, and actually what I saw was people were going about life as if it was completely normal. Um, you know, people were still going out, people were still doing other things. And, you know, I got messages such as, you know, I'm here for you if you need me, you know, and, and those don't help. And I think a lot of people I've spoken to since as well is like, no, messages like that don't help. It's just like, you know, pop round, yeah. you know, come and say hello, you know where I am. I can't go anywhere, you know. Um, those were the sort of things that I wouldn't say I expected, but is the things that I think were more appropriate, to be honest with you. Even a message to just say, sending lots of love or thinking of you, those things I found just stopped coming or didn't come at all. Yeah. And, you know, like I said to people two years old, there are certain people that didn't even bother with me when they found out my diagnosis. I still haven't heard from them now. But that's not on me. That's, yeah, that's, that's the, yeah. You're right, you're right. Oh. It's and, very hard, yeah. And when you came to the end of your treatments, mm. I know you went through some time after that. You yeah. talked about that quite a lot over the time yeah. that I've known you. Do you want to just share some of, of, of what happened at that point? Absolutely. So I think I went through my treatment being very strong, as mm. you do. Um, so I did. I went through six months of chemotherapy. I did 18 months of Herceptin injections. Um, I ended up having a double mastectomy, which took place over four operations. I think you, you get to a point in your cancer battle when you know you're going to be okay or not. And I think I got to that probably when I got through, say, half my chemo, and they were saying, look, everything looks great, we've done your scans, um, you know, the chemo is working. And I think I got to the point where I was like, okay, you know, I've got this, the battle, you know, seems that I'm, I'm going to win this. But it didn't make me feel any better mm. inside. It made me feel like thinking about my life after my treatment. I'd lost all my hair, for example. You know, I had put on two stone. Mm. Um, you know, my skin changed. Mm. Everything about my body had changed. And as I always say now, you know, what people need to understand about cancers and, and breast cancer particularly, mm. it robs you of everything that society says makes you a woman. Mm. You know, my periods stopped mm -hmm. and I was worrying. My new worry became, okay, it looks like I'm going to beat this, but how am I 
going to create a normal life for myself after? What is the new normal? And actually, what is my life? And who am I? Because I think you, you, you spend your time being so, so strong, 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 strong. And you get to that point. So for me, it came June 29th, 2017. I walked into the doctor's office after most of my treatment. And he turned around and said, you know, you're all clear. And I came out and I said, you know what? This is amazing. And, and, I, and I love this. And, you know, this is what I've been waiting for. This is, I could only have dreamt about this day at the start of my treatment. But. It was very, very difficult for me to feel joyous sides. Everyone else around me was more happy than I was. And I let that feeling manifest for about a month after my um, all clear diagnosis, uh, my all clear you know, outcome. And I was like, right, I don't feel okay. There's something there, there's something not right. And I didn't want to, I didn't want to make out that I was feeling ungrateful because I wasn't. But I just didn't feel good inside. Um, and then that's where breast cancer care came into play with you guys, you know, and, and I spoke to to you guys and I spoke about the fact that is this normal? Yeah. And it is. It is. <laughs> Unfortunately. I mean, yeah. But just um, going back to some of what you were just saying, thank you for sharing that. No, it's okay. just, uh, you know, I'm sure that's going to resonate so much with so many people out there. Um, Stephanie. Um, has come in and said, I found people thought once you had completed radiotherapy, it was all over. Yeah. And <laughs> five years of taking an astrozole, to not spend in my daughter's case, it's not over. No, it's not over. You're still going through treatment after. Look, even if you're not going through any treatments after, the trauma of what we go through, anybody with a cancer diagnosis, mm -hmm. Who knows how long that's going to take to get over? Mm -hmm. I think people thought because I, you know, this, you know, as soon as my treatment finished and the hair started to grow back and things like that, um, people thought that I'm okay, mm -hmm. you know, and and you're not, you know, that that mental scar of what you've been through, let alone the other drugs and things that we're taking on top of that, it, the battle is far from over. We've got the battle, which is the biggest battle of the mind, you know, that is the biggest battle to actually convince ourselves. Mm -hmm. I always say to people now, the biggest battle that I have every day is to convince myself my cancer's not coming back mm -hmm. and I'm going to be okay. That's my biggest battle. And it's great because I find that other people that have had cancer mm -hmm. completely relate to that, but others don't quite understand that. Yeah. So I do understand what she's saying. Ellen has um, just come in here and there. She's saying, I'm feeling up watching this as it resonates so much, probably for all of us. I think I've blocked a lot of the feelings that I didn't want to be scared of. Yeah, and that really, you know, tugs at my heartstrings because what I found in a lot of the work that I do now mm -hmm. with helping other women, particularly in my say, community. Do you want to say that? Yeah, so, so I set up a, a, pro, a, a project called the Black Women Rising Project because I found in my community uh, women don't talk about in the BAME community, which is Black and Asian minority ethnic, um, community we don't talk about it and it's because of cultural taboos and myths around cancer um, we don't really talk about our diagnosis and we don't talk about what it the, the mental effects the mental scars um, and what I found was when I started to blog about my journey I found the, the people that reached out to me some of the stories I heard were horrific you know I, I heard people messaging me saying well I'm not allowed to talk about this um, because it makes uncomfortable um, listening, you know, or at the moment whilst I'm going through treatment, I've got to stay away from the rest of the family members because they're worried that someone's going to catch it. <laughs> you know, that this is the things we're not being told. Um, you know, women that have felt demoralized when they've gone and got their free wig, you know, because the wigs, you know, the, the, um, the wigs that are available don't suit the hair type or they might be out of stock. In my case, in my hospital, they were out of stock from the ethnic section. You know, so these were the sort of stories I was hearing and lots of people were asking me for advice. And so for me, it was quite a nice, for me, it was it was important for me to create a space, a safe space for these women that needed help to come to. So I set up the Black Women Rising Project, which is a support group that people can come to. So it's peer support. We don't get any sort of motivational speakers or anything there. It's just a safe space where women can come and actually just talk about their disease in a very safe space with other people who have also gone through it. And off the back of that, I did a Black Women Rising exhibition, which Jack was, Anderson. which you came to, yeah, and, and Breast Cancer Care really supported me actually um, in running this exhibition. 
and it was um, you know a series of black and white portraits of women from the Bain community showing their cancer scars. So it could be breasts. We have people with lung cancer, people who have had you know um, blood cancers, and that exhibition was to raise awareness in our community. So that went really, that did really really well. Mm -hmm. We're still working on some stuff now. So I totally, totally hear, um, you know, the lady there when she was just saying about, you know, not talking about it. And I think it's not just about in my own community, but I think it's a universal thing. We get to the point where we feel that we, suppose the word is sort of unworthy of talking about it, particularly if the battle's over, you know, we're unworthy of talking about it anymore. And, you know, we don't have to, um, dwell on it. We feel like we're dwelling on it if we talk about it, but it is it's so important. Not over, is it? It's so not over. No. And I think it's an um, you said uh, very true. Some people have told me just to forget it and move yeah. on. But I can't. And no. and again, we hear that so yeah. often every day on the helpline. Absolutely. And we are here to talk that through. Yeah. Um, and listening to you, Leanne, yeah. hopefully it makes people realise that they can pick the phone up, they can yeah. talk to us. And it is really valid yeah. what you're feeling like at the end of treatment and, and going forward after that. And I'd say to everybody, like, these nurses are great. You know, they've really, really helped me. They've helped a lot of women as well with my programme. Um, you know, breast cancer care nurses are amazing. I've met a lot of them as well. They are just great. Just pick up the phone and have that chat. The, just chatting about stuff sometimes when somebody you don't know makes all the difference, you know, and, and I've seen, because of the projects I'm doing now, I've seen women's life change, just giving a platform to talk and express themselves, do it, don't be scared, um, just make that step, and, you know, you'd be so surprised, if it doesn't work for you, it doesn't work, but I find talking really, really helps, and, and I wouldn't be here being able to do this with you guys now if I wasn't able to talk about it, because, you know, what we've been through is horrific, and it's traumatizing and it, it takes a long long time to get over and we've got to start that healing journey i just think it's so important thank you so much no worries. amazing as always um the helpline number you can leave a message tonight we'll be back on the phones at nine o'clock tomorrow here again on friday and saturday morning is 0808 800 6000 um i will reply to any comments later on this evening uh, thank you for joining us this evening. Our next Facebook Live is July the 18th, and we're going to be joined by Alice May Perkis, who you might have seen on Facebook Live before, and her tattoo artist, who is going to talk through some of the top tips around having tattoos.